In this segment, I want to give you a couple of updates on what's been going on in the Wii homebrew scene and Wii development wise. Okay, so first up, what's really been going on? So some of you might have realized or, or heard that the Wii homebrew channel has been released. Now what does this mean? The Wii homebrew channel is uh, using the Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess hack, meaning you do not need a mod chip whatsoever to install the homebrew channel, is pretty much the first way that we can actually reliably and easily not only develop code and get it to run on the Wii, but on an end user, get it all looking relatively good. When I did the first Wii, uh, the Wii Soft Mod segment using the Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess, it was all kind of flimsy and clumsy. It was great, we had some great progress, but now it's exploding. The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess hack can be used to install the Wii Homebrew channel, and that will give you a graphical front end, as well as a standard way for developers to create their code to load on the Wii. You have to understand, when you have Homebrew, you need your, your primary chain loader, and then everything has to load in the memory and execute properly. So everything's kind of like a deck of cards that all have to kind of just go into place, or like, like a gears and cogs where everything just has to mesh and go in, in properly. And if you don't have a standard way of loading the code, if you don't have a standard way of entry points, and you know, man manipulating memory and getting, getting the code to run, then one person will, will, will write their code, and another person will write their code differently, and it just doesn't all work out properly because the loader itself doesn't know how to make it heads or tails. So, the Wii Homebrew channel is pretty cool because it's easy to install, it allows a graphical interface, it allows you to actually uh, load your, your media, sorry, your Homebrew, through multiple forms of media, including your front panel SD, this, uh, an SD Gecko on the, on the memory card slot, through the network, or through this little device called the SD Gecko, oh, sorry, the USB Gecko, which I'll get to in a moment. So, a lot of progress has been made on the piracy scene as well. Unfortunately, virtual console titles have been making it to the internet, and people have been installing WAD files, .wad extensions, which are pirated virtual console games or other applications. Now, the reason this is bad is because there is encryptions and security checks that take place when you actually pack a WAD file. There have been instances and reports of people improperly packing them, strictly on the pretense of turning your Wii into a brick. You have to understand that if you actually are going to install a Virtual Console title to your Nintendo and to, onto the Wii, Nintendo can and will find out about it. There are ways for them to actually figure it out. And it's not Big Brother secret, you know, backdoor crap. It's they have on account what Wii serial numbers have purchased what titles. So when you do an online update or you do a Wii Connect 24 check, it knows whether or not you're supposed to have something. Yes, Nintendo can detect it. It has been verified. Nintendo can find out what channels you have installed. Will they do anything about it? We don't know. Can they do something about it? Yes. The current versions of the Wii operating system, the iOS as it's called, is clearly being, uh, it can clearly check on, on whether or not you have what you have installed on your Wii. It's just how it works. So, if you install a virtual console title, two, one of two things may happen. Nintendo can bitch and complain. There are no reports of Nintendo bricking a Wii. None. Nintendo does not brick Wii's as of this recording, so don't say, oh, oh, they're re releasing all these updates that are screwing up your console. No, you're a fucking idiot, because you had to pirate a game that was packed by some shit scene crew that wanted zero day fucking credit for something that you should have just paid three dollars for. There's no reason you should be pirating virtual console games. Fire up your Xbox, fire up Linux, fire up Mac OS, fire up Windows, fire up Windows 98, fire up fucking DOS to play your goddamn NES games. Don't pirate them. If you wind up getting a virtual console title and you brick your system, you deserved it. But if for some reason you got some homebrew and you just screwed it up immensely, there are ways of recovering. I'll put it into the show notes. There have been releases of Wii recovery discs. It's an official disc made by the homebrew scene for people that have inadvertently had a PAL console with an NTSC update or vice versa. So it pretty much it's just a reverse engineer of how the actual Wii 
just does a system update via disk, except it's specifically de designed to hopefully recover your console. So if your console comes up and it says error so and so, you know, file not found and it gives the opera error, you can use these ISOs, you can burn them to a disk and hopefully recover your console. However, a mod chip is needed since it does get around the disk author uh, authorization and you know, authentication process, you do need a, a mod chip. Now, more process, uh, sorry, more progress has been made when it comes to uh, re reflashing the actual onboard firmware or the NAND. The NAND flash has recently been not only removed, but it's also been rewritten to using an Infectus, uh, an Infectus mod chip. I'll put some links on the show notes, but pretty much that's all you need to search by is Infectus mod chip NAND recovery. So that'll yield a lot of results. So, like I said, USB Gecko. What is this fun device? I love it. I'd, I'd make sweet love to this device if I could. And I'd really want to extend my thanks to the entire USB Gecko team for all of their hard work on this device. I would recommend anyone that's got a fat chubby for doing Wii Homebrew or GameCube Homebrew to get one of these little sons of bitches. It can do more than you can possibly imagine and then some. A couple of episodes ago, I did some work on the GameCube using the Viper GC Extreme mod chip. The mod chip plugged into the, uh, into the high-speed data bus of the GameCube, allowing USB functionality. And what this device let me do is dump the RAM and compare it so we can do RAM hacking and cheat engine searches and stuff like that. It also allowed save states. It also allowed me to dump my disks. It also let me load my homebrew. It, it had so many features, I, couldn't, I honestly can't remember, remember them all off the top of my head. The USB Gecko is a non-intrusive mod. So you do not really need to open up your, your, your Wii or your GameCube. It plugs directly into the memory card slot, and it will offer a full USB bus. So we can do RAM hacking. We can do uh, uh, the, USB, uh, the USB Gecko team has a cheat engine coming out. I've been doing a lot of RAM hacking. Uh, it's backwards compatible with the GameCube. You can dump your GameCube, your GameCube single layer, Wii single layer, and Wii double layer DVDs through the USB bus. Uh, you can manipulate your front panel SD card. You can manipulate your save games on your memory card. You can back them up or you can put them back. You can back them up, hack them, put them back, no problem. Uh, you can do screenshots. You can stream MP3s. Uh, the one thing that really turns me on is the RAM hacking. That's going to be a fun one. I hope to get a segment out next month on that one. But anyway, let's get to the process of installing the Wii Homebrew channel you know, via the Twilight Princess hack. And we'll go and get the USB Gecko going and I'll show you some of the features of both of them. The first thing you have to do is point your favorite browser of choice to webrew.org. I'll put a title, up, a title up on the screen so you have the URL for record. And you want to search for the Twilight hack in their search box. This will bring you to the Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess chain loader hack. I have previously done a segment on this. There's really no need for explanation, but I'll give a, a quick overview just for the, the noobs and, all, and whatnot. You need to go and download said file. That's a save game for Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess. You have to put it in a specific folder on your SD card. In this case, it's going to go into private, Wii, title, RZDE, and have data.bin according to your region and, and whatnot. And you're going to copy this save game from the SD card over to your Wii, and then you're going to execute said file. Um, Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess hack is triggered once you leave the area or when you talk to the gentleman standing in front of you. Then you're going to want to go to the Wii Homebrew, uh, Homebrew channel page and this will give you step-by-step uh, uh, -step instructions on how to prepare your SD card for the Wii Homebrew installation. Remember, no mod chip is needed. The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess exploit will trigger this exploit, uh, sorry, it will trigger this installation of the, of the Wii Homebrew channel. And then if you need any information, you can go to the Wii Homebrew Channel website and get more information on what is currently supported with the Wii Homebrew Channel. So, with all of this said, we're going to head over to the Wii side and we're going to get the Wii Homebrew Channel installed. But, let me go and take a quick look of what I've had to do just roughly on the SD card. So, we've got boot.elf, which is the Wii Homebrew Channel installer. We have in our apps folder some... Uh, utilities, we got the USB Gecko, uh, region free, which is made by the USB Gecko team, which will allow you to play um, and uh, play uh, import games from other regions, but not pirated bootlegs, which is really cool. This is actually uh, the uh, freeware equivalent of the Daytel Freeloader. We've got the SD front loader, which I've used in previous episodes. Uh, we've got Quake, we've got Tetris, and 
the demo for Wii 64, which is not much playable, but showing a lot of progress. So, let's go ahead over to the Wii side and have a little fun, shall we? Alright, here we have the typical Legend of Zelda exploit. You know, it's very well covered, very well explained. Uh, like I said, I've done uh, uh, information on it in a previous uh, segment of a previous episode. And this is going to trigger the, the Homebrew Channel installer. And disclaimer, this product does, comes with absolutely no warranty, neither express or implied, yada yada yada, so if anything goes wrong, blame yourself, not them. It's telling us to press start on a GameCube controller. I'm going to go ahead and do that. And it's going to go ahead and install the Homebrew Channel. It does not take a very long, long time, and like I said, it does not take a mod chip to do this. This is completely soft mod. And if you notice that now you'll have the Homebrew Channel. Now, just like any channel, you can go into your system menu and delete this if you need space. It's not, not a problem. And it's going to load your homebrew from your SD card. Once you, you, know, you have to prepare it properly. Unfortunately, I didn't get Quake uh, installed properly because I'm an idiot. Uh, we got the USB Gecko boot.elf, which is used for the, uh, the cheating and uh, USB Gecko utility, which I'll get in a little bit. Unfortunately, right now, this utility does not work properly with the, with the homebrew loader, so you have to still use the... Um, the Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess exploit, so, but I can guarantee you that they will get this working with the Homebrew Loader, uh, Homebrew Channel very shortly. We've got the Region Free, which Region Free is a program which allows import games to be played on your console region. Insert a Wii game and press A on the Wii, the Wii Remote to boot a game. So, pretty much what this does is if you have a PAL game in an NTSC console, and originals of course, you can go and play imports on your console. The, now the thing is that if you do need an actual firmware update, it will block it. So if you need a firmware update to run the game and it's not available through your, your online, um, the online update, then you're just going to have to wait for Nintendo to release the update in your region. Till then, you're shit out of luck. We got the front SD loader, which I've used previously, but with the homebrew channel, you really don't need it, but still, it's good to have it. We've got Tetris. We've also got Wii 64, which is a very promising N64 emulator. Not many games are very playable right now, but it, I can guarantee you it will, it's making a lot of progress. Um, and the guys that are working on it are very, very talented, and it does show a lot of promise. Then there's also the Scum VM for the point-and-click uh, adventure games, and Quake, which for some reason just isn't popping up. I most likely put the config file wrong. Um, there's NES, Super Nintendo, there's GameCube Linux, as well as Wii Linux that are running. Uh, there's a lot of promise. This is just, uh, we're just getting our feet wet. So, I don't got much time, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to load up the USB Gecko side, uh, the USB Gecko Wii side server, and I'll show you some of the features of the USB Gecko. If you notice up in the screen over here, we've got a very boring screen. This is the, U, uh, the USB Gecko Wii side server. It also works for the GameCube. And on the PC side, we have some of the USB client features. Now, this is a uh, USB client 1.0 beta 5 cheat edition. This is specifically made for RAM hacking and things of the such. So we'll go through some of the things uh, that you know it can do. First you have to connect to the actual USB Gecko. If you notice in the bottom left hand corner over here it says connected. Some of the Wii mode tools is the NAND dump which actually lets you dump your NAND flash for manipulation. Doesn't as of right now I don't know if it actually lets you upload but that's always good to go and fun to poke around if you want to do any kind of virtual console or NAND hacking. The executable file loader will allow you to uh, upload your DOL or ELF files. Very good for loading your homebrew. The memory card tool will actually communicate to your uh, GameCube memory cards, allowing you to upload, download, archive, or otherwise manipulate them if you're into save game hacking. They've also got a music player. Uh, it'll let you play MP3s one at a time through your TV. It's, it's kind of clumsy, but it works. I'd expect it to get a little bit better in the future. Uh, the disk tools, file system tools, and SD tools have been grayed out. I really haven't, a chance, haven't had a chance to play with them. If you load in a GameCube, uh, or you load your Wii into GameCube mode, or on an actual GameCube, you can load your, your dull or ELF files. Great for homebrew, so you don't have to keep making 1.4 gig disks for 32K, I, um, 32K homebrew. Same thing, you got a memory card tool to manipulate your memory cards. Uh, you got a DVD extractor, which is good, because if you're actually in GameCube mode on a Wii, you can back up your Wii games, whether it's a single layer, a dual layer, or uh, a GameCube disc. You can use your Wii to back up your, your games. It's also got a music player. If you go to Start Game, this is actually used for the remote debugger. Depending on which, uh, which hook type you'll need, 
Uh, in, some, in most instances, if you're on a Wii, you'll be using a Wii game hook, and this will actually start your game, allowing the remote debugger. The remote debugger is quite literally a RAM management utility. This will actually allow you to set breakpoints, which are pretty cool because you can see all the uh, hardware registers of the Wii, and actually make conditions of which registers. What registers do is it actually looks at the hardware for conditions. So you can actually set a register to say, look for whenever the X and Y buttons on a GameCube controller is actually pressed, and then create a condition from there that'll actually I don't know, maybe give you infinite health, or give you an item, or take away an item, whatever. We'll leave that for the uh, Wii hacking segment, the RAM hacking segment, if I can get that done. You can also dump hex in a specific range, which will, will it's, that's it, it just dumps the actual RAM of the uh, GameCube or the, or the Wii. You can also upload code, you can trace and step using debug functions of in assembly where your functions are going. You can freeze and unfreeze your console because watching code fly by at a few million uh, instructions per second can get a little tedious or confusing, so you can hit the freeze button right here. It'll freeze the console, it'll halt, make some god horrible noises, and allow you to analyze the code going through system RAM, and then from there do whatever the hell you want. Then you can unfreeze it and be on with it. Um, you can also upload a cheat patch. I've got some cheat patches created by, uh, with the help of the postings on the USB Gecko forums. What these cheat patches do is it essentially it's an action replay or a code breaker. The, I'll get into this in another segment because uh, I'm running out of time here, but pretty much what this will do is in single player mode, it'll actually lock memory addresses so I always have specific weapons. I can modify this in a hex editor and have pretty much whatever damned weapons I want. It is glitchy, it will crash the console, but I have to admit it's really fun playing around with the breakpoints as well as peeking and poking RAM contents. If you actually want to go to certain uh, uh, hex addresses in RAM, you can actually enter it here and check it out in assembly or in hex. And if you want to see what happens when you poke a specific RAM address with a hot poker, most of the times it'll crash, but fun effects do happen. We'll leave all that stuff for another segment. Uh, the cheat codes just go straight to uh, trainers, which are not yet available. They will be available soon, as well as cheat patches. You can also go for a screen grabber, which is really great for all you Smash Brothers psychotics out there that have to go and keep posting millions of images to, of Smash Brothers talent, uh, talentless wits and other bullshit to your online blogs as if someone actually gave a rat's ass. Whoop. Uh, there will be some firmware tools eventually, and the help really doesn't bring you anywhere. Alrighty. So, those are just some of the functions and features of the USB Gecko. The USB Gecko team is working on a new tool called the, I think it's called the, the Wired or the Weird. I don't know how they pronounce it yet. They'll let us know. It should come out in a couple of days. It's going to be a tool explicitly and strictly designed for Wii RAM hacking. It's got a whole cheat engine put into it. I'm not condoning online cheating but we'll leave that for the next segment. So, there you go. The Wii Homebrew channel, USB Gecko. Two really great breakthroughs in the Wii Homebrew scene. Let's see where everything else goes. Hopefully there'll be some future segments on it. All right. If you brick your way, go online, do some searches. Hopefully you can screw, uh, you can unscrew your stuff. But yeah, can't have it all. Today I'm going to talk about the PDF file. I'm sure a lot of you have used it before. You've noticed that hardware that you buy now they're too cheap to print out the user manuals, so they put them on a PDF file. But I'm sure a lot of you haven't made a PDF file before, and it's actually quite simple. So today I'm going to show you how. Uh, PDF file stands for Portable Document Format, I believe. Uh, it was created by Adobe back, I think, 10 or 15 years ago, a while ago. Of course, they fucked it up. You know, I'm sure if you've used Acrobat Reader, you, it takes forever to open it up, and it's a pain in the ass. So my suggestion is, first thing. If you're going to use PDFs, go download Foxit Reader or something else because Adobe products are just bloated and you don't want to use them. But anyway, while I'm getting sidetracked, uh, PDFs are great. I'm sure you've, like everybody else, you've uh, been too cheap to go out and buy ink, so you bring your, bring your shit into work to print it out, only to find out that their security measures don't allow you to print out your own JPEGs or text files or whatever. But a lot of times, if it's in PDF format, you can get around that. So that's another great thing. And a lot of you still go to school, so I'm sure you know how heavy it can be carrying around a shitload of textbooks. So it's great if you can just scan them into a small PDF file and then 
You can read them on a pocket PC, cell phone, Nintendo DS, I'm sure. Even a laptop's a lot lighter than carrying around a thousand one textbooks. So, we're going to go over to the computer now and I'm going to show you how to actually make a PDF file. You're going to need to download a program called, called Cute PDF. I'll put the link up on the screen. It's, it's freeware and it's fairly simple to install. Just read the fucking directions. If you, if you can't figure it out, then, then fast forward. I'm not explaining how to install it. But once you get it installed, uh, I'm going to show you on the screen just highlight all the files you want to put in the PDF. I'm selecting a bunch of pictures from the camping trip we just went on. Uh, just highlight all the pictures, right click, print, and select all the pictures you want to print, like I said. And then for the printer, select Cute PDF Writer. Click Next. I know I want to rotate these. Oh, that's right. Go back. Go to printing preferences. Sorry, I keep forgetting this. You want to put them in landscape mode, otherwise all your pictures will be sideways. I've done that many times and screwed up. Okay, and now print. As you see, it'll start. It's a document to print out. So. Here's your name and click finish as you can see here it looks like it's printing it's actually just writing a PDF file great that's done now you see there's a new PDF file named BSOD camping trip on my desktop just double click it and look and it works so that's fairly simple probably shouldn't have had to explain this to you but not everybody knows everything I hope you get some use out of this Today we're going to do some design on 2.4 GHz Cantennas, or some people might know it as the Pringles Cantenna. Unfortunately this term is incorrect, it's really not called a Cantenna, it's just a cute term some geeks thought of. It's actually called a waveguide. The reason it's called a waveguide is because when you have a can, when you have a tube, even coax for that matter, because electrically it is a conduit for, for RF signals, that radio signal is going to actually bounce up and down inside of this actual tube, this metal tube, and reflect up and down until it finally gets to a driven element, some kind of receiving or transceiving element. Now, here is my Bluetooth waveguide. It is one sexy bitch. Some of you have, may have seen this already on my Picasa page. This is a 3.5 inch diameter metal can at I think 7.5 or 8 inches long, uh, so about, about 9 inches long, and I haven't used any coax connectors. I directly soldered a piece of coax right into the can. Uh, that's something that I want to cover today. Uh, before we even get into building, designing, how to select the right can. You can't just take any can out of the trash and use it. Just like we've, I've previously explained, your radio frequency, radio frequency is directly correlated with your actual active antenna which means if you change the length and diameter of this can, you change the frequency in which it can receive. Ideally, you want something between 3 and 3.75 inches. Some people use smaller, some people use larger diameters. This is a 4-inch can. The actual cutoff frequency to this is about 1.8 gigahertz, if I remember correctly. It doesn't go into 2.4. There are mathematical calculations that you, can, that you can use to determine if a diameter can and a length of a can will work for your frequency. Um, I have heard people use, using these cans quite often and they work well, so I've opted out to use one of these. I've also noticed that standard soup cans are very good. They're actually the perfect diameter for 2.4 gigahertz, but one single can is not long enough. The longer your can, the longer your tube, the longer your waveguide, the more directional it's going to be. In some cases that's very good, in some cases that's bad, so it's up to you to decide. Now, this is a standard soup can. 
Now, it's not long enough. It needs to be up to 9 inches long or longer. So, at one point, I actually cut the bottom off of one of the cans, and I tried to weld them together in absolute horrific failure, which is why you see a whole bunch of disgusting burn marks on this can. I haven't found a very good or reliable way of actually soldering these two cans together. Um, aluminum tape would work, but it's really not much of a permanent solution. It can be broken easily. You could always just take some, some band iron, which is just a piece of uh, malleable metal, like an erector set piece that has holes in the side. You put it up, put a strip like so, and you put some rivets. And then you do another one here, you do another one here, and you just put it around so they stay together. Be creative. Uh, use a lot of the information that I've given you already on creating other stuff. Look around your house and see what you can put together. As for selecting the right can, you got to make sure that you have the right diameter and you got to do all the calculations. If you're absolutely mathematically inept, go to the show notes. On the forums, I will put links to 2.4 gigahertz waveguide calculators, or just Google the term. There are a bunch of people that created Java applets that will allow you to punch in the values, the diameter of your can, and your frequency. And it'll tell you how long you need it to be and where you need to place your driven element. When you're selecting a can, try to get something that doesn't have too many ridges in it. If you notice, this has, has ridges. It's really not a bad thing, but it can actually have a slight effect on your signal propagation. Reason being is, when that radio wave enters the can, it's going to bounce up and down, up and down, up and down. These ridges might actually affect the frequency. Small ridges, like on these, aren't too big of a deal. Ideally, you want to get something that's absolutely smooth. It's really hard to find a can that is absolutely smooth with no ridges in it at a 3.5 inch diameter at about 8, 9, 10 inches long. There's a lot to building this, so that's what we're going to focus on today, building. So, you've done the math, and you've got a couple of cans that you want to experiment with. How are you going to attach your can to your driven element to your car? And this is where some of the creativity for today is going to come in. Let's go to the table side, and I'm going to start to put this together and explain some of the ways of how to directly solder in your card to your can. Alright, some of the typical components for any electronics project. Soldering iron, right here. Solder. Basic tools, I got some wire cutters around somewhere. I got some wire cutters. I got some surgical tools, but you know those pliers and such will work just fine. You've selected your can, you've done your math, you've done your measurements, and you've punctured your, your hole for your driven element. How are you going to attach that driven element is really it's up to you. There's a couple of ways. Primarily people will use these, these panel mount end connectors. We've seen them before on the show. They work just fine. Um, you'll just have to go ahead and punch all the appropriate holes and attach it. Then you take some copper wire. You cut the appropriate length. In this case, I need 31 millimeters, which I've marked clearly on my wire, 31 millimeters. You would jam it in the hole and you would solder it in and compensate and cut and make sure you got everything the appropriate length and you're good to go. But things aren't always as what they seem. I'm not going to really show you how to go and punch holes in a can and mount this. You really should be able to do that on your own. The only thing I will suggest is if you are going to go and get a panel mount connector, when you do drill the holes in the can, drill them slightly smaller so they actually have something to grip into. If you drill them too, too small, or sorry, if you drill them too big, it's really hard to reach your hand inside of here with a pair of pliers to use nuts and bolts to try to fix everything. Also, when you're attaching anything to the can, make sure they do not protrude too far inside of the can itself because that could affect your actual reception. Not by much, but still, you want to try to have this, the inside of this can as smooth as possible. With all these ripples in the can, it's already hard to do as it is. Today I'm actually going to go and make a Bluetooth cantana or a Bluetooth waveguide for Mustang. We remember this little Bluetooth guy. This was, I think, from episode 19. I have some coax on here. I believe this was pulled out of a laptop. I don't know the name of the coax, but I do know it's used for laptop Wi-Fi cards for the internal antennas. I think it's LRX or LMX or something like that. I'm not sure. If anyone knows the name, please put it on the forums and let us know. Um, if you don't have this coax cable or access to it, and you actually took our recommendations, this is a Linksys WUSB 54G uh, Wi-Fi card, which is, I believe, Athros chipset based, or a, a Raylink chipset based, and it actually has an antenna already that has a length of coax. So you don't even have to do anything. You just got to desolder this, and you can use this. You don't have much to work with, so make sure you don't fuck up. So you have this coax, how are you going to get it 
attached to the can. How are you going to get shield attached to the can, but in the meantime, isolate the driven element? Well, there's one of two things you can do. Also, I, I forgot to mention, if I haven't mentioned it already, if you have LMR195, that will also work for this project. You just have to go and adjust accordingly. What I would suggest doing is you get yourself some kind of metal pipe. This is copper pipe used for ice makers for your refrigerator. This is actually called water feed line. This actually fits quite nicely over LMR195 like so, if you can see. So what you can do is you pre-tin the inside of the, co uh, of the coax shield, you solder your driven element onto this, and when you put this through, this pipe is going to act as a shield. Anything being exposed from outside of this pipe is your driven element. That is going to be soldered to the top of the can. Now, I don't plan on using LMR 195. That's, that's a little bit big for this little USB card. I've got this thin coax. So what I've done is I've got a thinner piece of pipe. This was obtained from an old antenna, but if you have some old pens, the ink cartridges are also solderable metal. The thing is, if they're shiny and chrome, the chances are you can't solder to it. So go and take uh, a nail file or some sandpaper or even an, uh, some kind of abrasive wheel on a rotary tool and try to get a nice copper coat around the side of it. I've already gone ahead and pre-tinned this. I went to my can and I pre-tinned that. Now, I pre-tinned it by method of a little butane lighter. I just went ahead and I, I lit it up and I put it to the can like so. Wait until I got really nice and hot and I gently fed in some solder. Just like that. And, I mean, it's, it takes a bit of practice and it's really hard for me to do this on, on camera. But, point being is, you get the area hot with a butane, this is a campfire lighter you can use. You could use a soldering gun or even a, a low power butane pen torch, whatever you got laying around. 35 watt soldering iron, chances being, it's not really going to work too well for this application. So you've drilled your hole slightly larger than your actual pipe. Now, I'm actually going to be using this little bugger right here. And that's, gonna, that's already pre-tinned, and that's going to fit in just like so. You don't want it to protrude too far into the can. I'll try to... Right here I've got some, some magic hands and I've got some hard drive magnets attached to it. That way my can won't go anywhere. Because if you're actually going to be uh, using a butane lighter on this in the method that I'm using, well, it's going to get hot and anyone that's holding it isn't going to want to hold it for too long. So I'll try to get a nice shot inside. Notice how it's not protruding. It's not really sticking too far into the can. So now it's just a matter of getting this to stay in. So I'm going to try to use my soldering iron. I would highly recommend using some kind of locking pliers themselves. That way you have something that'll, that'll lock onto it and keep you from having to go and grab a scorching hot piece of metal. Now I'm going to try to use a 35 watt soldering iron for this, but I really don't think it's going to work. Or it's going to work really well and I'm going to have to eat shit. And it seems to be working really well. I just can't see what I'm doing. Actually, this is, this is working better than I actually anticipated. You don't have to get this perfect. Just get it sturdy enough that you're happy with so it won't actually break away over time. And if need be, go ahead and try to feed more solder into it. Don't worry about making a mess of solder. You want to try to have as good of an electrical connection with this as possible. This little pipe like I've said, is going to be your coax shield. There we go. Soldered on. Yay! Wasn't very difficult at all. Um, I would recommend leaving a fair amount of length coming off of this. Reason being is you need some kind of structure that's going to hold your driven element. So. For the most part, your driven element, that little nubbin that needs to stick up, is going to start right about there. So only this few couple of millimeters on the tip here are really going to be soldering your shield in. The rest of this, as well as the can, is going to act as your shield as well. So, 
by now you're probably asking yourself, well, if I'm going to be soldering, uh, if I'm just going to be putting a piece of wire in the middle of this, like so, what's keeping it from shorting out? Heat shrink tubing. You could also go ahead and use electrical tape. Just wrap it around enough so it's isolated and it won't short out. So I'm actually going to go off camera and do this because I have to use my, my hair dryer or a heat gun to put the heat shrink tubing around. It doesn't matter if you actually cover your driven element itself. That doesn't matter because radio will pierce straight through plastic. So if you just want to coat a very long length of, of copper pipe, which would actually be a good idea because copper does actually tarnish over time, so you could protect it with some heat shrink tubing. I'm going to go ahead off camera and I'm going to prepare this with some heat shrink tubing and then we're going to finish the rest of this off. I've gone ahead and just put a couple of coats of heat shrink tubing on the driven element, which is right here. Let's see if I can get a good shot of that right there. This piece. Right. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to cut a little, I'm going to cut all the extra off because we really don't need so much, but leaving a little bit more than necessary so we can solder onto it. But not so much where it sticks out past the shield. You insert and position it so you can actually get it in there, but don't put it in, yet, in just yet. Pre-tin this and go ahead and solder your center conductor to the driven element. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Shouldn't be a very difficult thing to do. Remember, as always, that coax cable does not like excessive amounts of heat. So be very, very careful when actually working with the coax itself, especially this really, really thin stuff. My apologies for anything out of frame. This is actually quite difficult to get in frame. There we go. Now the driven element has been successfully soldered to the actual coax. I'm going to go ahead and feed it down the actual shield pipe right here and I'm going to position this in and I'm going to try to make it in such a way where I can solder the, um, the actual shield directly to the tube. So I'm going to go ahead off camera I'm going to position everything so you can clearly see this process. Here's an inside close-up shot of the can. There's the driven element sticking out of the can. If you look really, really close, you can actually just see the protrusion of some of the heat shrink tubing. Here's a close-up of the actual joint that was soldered on. It wasn't very difficult, as you saw earlier. I've got the, uh, the shielding coming across the side. Now, you don't have to get the shielding completely over this. Just solder it on, and be very, very careful not to actually short this out, because remember, this is not what's called a driven loop system. This is an open loop system, meaning your solder point needs, uh, your, your dipole, your antenna, your elements should not be shorting out. So again, using the soldering iron, go ahead, just do some pre-tinning. And also, as always, coax does not like to be heat it up too much, and we're going to try to get a decent amount of solder on this. Alright, I think that's good enough. Uh, you really can't see because of the angle. Let me try to adjust this for you real quick. There we go. It's soldered on, nice and neat. Now it's just a matter of just attaching with a couple of uh, zip ties or something. Now, the can itself is unprotected. There's no finishing on it. So I'm going to go ahead and put a nice coat of blue paint on this. And I'm going to do some finishing touches. And we'll do a recap. Here is the final product. We've got the tin can. We've got the Bluetooth card. Or it could be your Wi-Fi card just dangling about. It's going to be mounted right underneath this little piece of white PVC pipe. I'm going to take a couple of zip ties and just kind of zip tie around so this is nice and sturdy and it's going into a tripod. Now the paint's still a little wet so I'm just going to put this down and let it settle for a little bit. And uh, you should have seen this one already. This is mine. Nice flat black, no ridge can. Um, 
If you go and get a tripod, I've noticed that you can actually angle them like so. If you've got a satellite dish, like I've got back here, you can actually slide this into the arm where the old satellite receiver unit was and use your satellite dish for even extended range, but we'll get into parabolas another day. So to pretty much recap what we did today, first you have to find a can by going through a couple of mathematical formulas, hit the show notes, hit the forums, uh, and I will give you the links to the actual mathematical formulas as well as calculators. If you're too incompetent to do the math, the calculators will do all the math for you. You get a can, and you have to drill a hole into it, so you can either mount an RF connector at an appropriate point of wavelength. The radio waves will actually enter the can, reflect up and down and all around all the sides until it hits the actual active driven element. If it goes past the driven element, it'll actually reflect off of the back of the can and then into the actual driven element using this back plate as a reflector. So that's the basic idea of how waveguide works. The longer your barrel is, the longer your can is, the more directional it's going to be. You can do modifications by adding a 30 degree funnel around the front of it to accept more radio signal, but I'll leave that for the show notes. Now, once you get the can selected, prepped, and ready to go, you can drill a hole into it, you put your radio connector at the appropriate, wavelength, uh, the appropriate spot of the wavelength with a driven element calculated to a specific wavelength. If you don't want to use an RF connector, you can go ahead and take a piece of copper or a piece of tubing, you put, uh, electrically isolate your signal, your signal wire, the driven element, using heat shrink, electrical tape, or user imagination, and get all that hooked up to your card, however you see fit. Um, there should be more information on the show notes, as always. Check out previous episodes if you don't know what I'm talking about with the RF connectors. This is a pretty much straightforward idea. So, go out there, start experimenting, have fun, good luck. Okay, today on BSD, we're going to show you a mod so stupidly simple your grandmother could do it. The reason I say that is, actually I learned how to do this in the early 80s. My grandmother, uh, basically back then they didn't have uh, remote controls on the TV. So she would put a switch on an extension cord so she didn't have to get up and turn off the TV. Well, today we're going to do something similar to that, but uh, a lot of you have been wanting to go out and get expensive soldering irons. I've seen them for, I don't know, around $100 that have variable heat. And you don't need to do that. I got an extension cord here. I, this is just a cord from an old vacuum cleaner. I cut it off, put a plug on the end. Just take an extension cord. And a standard light dimmer and we're going to wire this into uh, to the extension cord this way you can control a bunch of shit you can you can if you plug a fan into it you can adjust the feet of the sp speed of the fan if you plug a light in it you can dim the light or best of all plug your soldering iron in and now your tw 10 20 dollar soldering irons worth just as much as your friend's 150 dollar soldering iron so uh, let's readjust the camera and see what we can do. I'm going to put the switch up near the plug. That way it's right there, easy to control. You can put it wherever you want on the wire. Um, first thing you need to do is cut the wire. and strip down the ends.
Now, I'm going to take the two white white wires, strip them down, and tie them in together. I could use a little more wire. If I had scissors, I'd trim away all this insulation, but I don't have them on me, so we're just going to deal with that. Okay, now we're going to strip down each side of the black wire and wire that into our light dimmer. green wires for ground and this is an ungrounded cord so we're just going to leave that the hell alone. Let's put this back on. Sorry about the odd angle, this tripod that I'm stuck using right now is a piece of shit. Okay, now let's plug it in and make sure it doesn't blow the fuck up. Light into here. 
testing purposes. We'll be right back. And look, uh, if I can adjust the camera, you can see this. This is a fluorescent light, but oh, it turns it into a strobe. Hey, that's pretty cool. Um, I'm gonna re-record. I'm gonna record the rest of this when I get home. As you can see, I can dim it a little bit, but because I'm using a fluorescent light out here, um, it really fluorescent lights don't dim too well. So I'll record more when I get home with an incandescent light. Okay, I'm back home now. Uh, the product's finished, as you can see. Just a light box, extension cord, and a plug on the end. I'm going to plug my light into it now that I got an incandescent bulb that will actually work. Okay. Now let's hope I don't electrocute myself. Okay, turn the lights off. Okay, the lights are off in my house. I'm turning it on as you can see. Turning it up. And then adjust it. Right, come on. As you can see, I can get it down pretty low before it shuts off. So, you can turn the lights back on. Okay, so, yeah, that focus takes a while to adjust. Uh, yeah, anyway, you can hook your soldering iron up to this and you can get a pretty good range of temperature on it. Or like I said, any other device, whether it be a heat gun, a fan, whatever you can think of. Anyway, I hope you found this useful and I hope it saves you a lot of money.